Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhat and this session we would look at consolidated tax return. This topic is typically covered in a corporate accounting course, definitely on the CPA reg section and in the enrolled agent exam. As always, I would like to remind you to connect with me on LinkedIn if you haven't done so. YouTube is where you would need to subscribe. I have 1,600 plus accounting, auditing, finance and tax lectures. This is a list of all the courses that I cover, including CPA questions hundreds of them on my website you'll find additional resources such as the powerpoint slides true false multiple choice problems exercises if you're studying for your cpa 2000 plus cpa questions i strongly suggest you check out my website okay so we're going to be talking about the consolidated return what does it mean to file a consolidated return well this is very similar to consolidation in financial accounting under gap similar but not the same if you remember under gap maybe you maybe you do maybe you don't to consolidate you have to own 50 percent plus under tax you have to own 80 percent so so notice it's more so if we have a parent and this is a subsidiary if the parent owns more than 80 percent of the subsidiary they they can they can consolidate if this subsidiary owns this subsidiary then all these are in the same group then if this subsidiary owns this subsidiary then these are all in the same group so they consolidate however if the parent owns this subsidiary and the parent owns the yellow subsidiary those they have a common common parent but they are not connected. Those are brother and sister. So the yellow and the blue are brother and sister. Under those circumstances, they don't consolidate. But if the blue own the green, more than, here we're talking about more than 80%, then the green own the sub, then they will consolidate. All right? So the election to file a consolidated return is only available to an affiliated group. What is an affiliated group? It exists when a corporation owns at least 80% of the voting power and the stock value of another corporation, either directly or indirectly. So what happens when you consolidate? The privilege of filing a consolidated return is based on the concept that an affiliated group of a corporation constitute a single taxable entity despite the existence of technically separate businesses, parent and the subsidiary, they're technically one group. So by filing a return, the corporation can eliminate intercompany profit and losses on the principle that the tax liability should be based on the transaction with the outsider rather than the intra-group affair. So what you can do, you could eliminate intercompany profit. Okay, so you, you don't have to pay taxes on that and you could eliminate the losses as well. So what are the advantages of consolidation? One is you losses from one group can be used to shelter the income of another group. So what happened is A, if they have income, if they if they own 80% of B, if B have losses, they can offset the gain and pay less taxes. Taxation of intercompany dividend might be eliminated, and we talked about this in another session. Deduction may be optimized due to a percentage limitation being modified as a result of the consolidated process. We will see what does that mean in a moment. Simply put, when you consolidate, your 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 uh, your uh, your percentages will go higher. Like for example, for charitable contributions, so you can take more deduction. Recognition of income from certain intercompany transaction might be deferred. So sometimes you'd receive income intercompany. You can defer it. You can pay it later, basically. And consolidation also eliminate any intercompany pricing problems, which is basically transfer pricing among related corporations that might arise under Section 428-36. And what does that mean? Let's take a look at specifically this example so we get it out of the way. Let's assume Rust Corporation leases a building to Cramson Corporation for 6000 Now, here's what happened. The IRS says, guess what? The, the real market value is 9000 not 6000 Well, a Section 4... 82 allocation would increase trust corporation monthly income by 3,000. So the IRS said, guess what? You need to increase your income by 3,000 because the fair market value is nine, not six. Not a problem. Okay. If Rust and Crimson are member of the affiliated group that file a consolidated return, the 482 adjustment would not be made. And if it's made, it's not a big deal. Increasing Rust corporate rent income by 3,000 is meaningless because it's offset by 3,000 increase and in the deduction rent expense of Crimson. So if one company increased their income, or if Rust increased their income, they're supposed to increase income to 9,000. Well, guess what? Crimson will increase their expenses by, to 9,000. So it will offset each other because it's an affiliated group. So basically, there's no benefit to do so. So it, it avoids problems like this when you file 
when you file a consolidated return. Some of the disadvantages of consolidation is the election is binding upon subsequent year and can be only evaded of the, avoided if the makeup of the affiliate group changes or the IRS consent to rev revocation of the consolidated return status. Now, when you select to, to do an, aff an affiliate group, all the parties involved will have to agree. If that's not the case, then you cannot have it. So in case you need to change, sometimes you need the IRS consent to uh, to basically stop preparing your tax return for the whole group, okay? Also, recognition of losses from certain intercompany transaction might be deferred, and that's not good. If you have losses for taxes, you wanna take them, you don't want to defer them. If you are an affiliated group, they might be deferred for later until they are transferred to an outside party, and we would look at an example. The requirement that all group members use the parent tax year could create a short tax year for the subsidiaries. So you have to follow, all the subsidiaries will have to follow the parent tax year, which in some situation could be bunching income and you have a full year for carryover purposes. Sometimes it mess up the, the, income, um, the income and the taxes. Also administrative compliance, there's, it create complication because believe me, consolidated tax return are not easy, they're complex. And I did few of them when I was in practice, so they're not easy. A further negative consideration is that, that the tax rules for filing in consolidated return may not mesh with the applicable for those for financial accounting purposes. So for financial accounting purposes, you can do consolidation. Certain rules for consolidation are different. One prime example is if you have a foreign corporation. In a foreign corporation, you can include your foreign with your, with your local for financial accounting. For tax purposes, foreign corporation cannot be included. And that's what's gonna do, that's gonna create additional complication and you're gonna have to explain to explain the reconciliation between financial accounting numbers of the consolidation and the tax return, which is basically what we're talking about is additional administrative burden because the numbers will not match up because if you're showing your financial statements and you're showing your tax return, one is consolidated and showing that foreign subsidiary, the other one is not, then, then you have to do more work to show the reconciliation, the difference. So those are some, some of the disadvantages. Let's take a look at how we compute uh, taxable income, okay? So there are several categories that do not enter in the determination of the taxable income. For example, intercompany transaction are disregarded, profit and loss are disregarded, um, dividend paid by one group to another, that's basically eliminated, gain and losses from certain intercompany, sales are not recognized until the asset is sold, to a third party. And we'll look, we'll look at an example shortly. So what do we consolidate? So in computing the taxable income for any consolidated return, several items are computed on a group basis. And typically, typically on a CPA exam, they ask you questions about what's included and what's not. I mean, consolidated is tested on the exam, not that heavily, that much have that heavily, like for example, as partnership, as corporation, but you just have to need to be aware of it. So what are those items? Well, you can net capital gains and capital losses, section 1231. You could net casualty gain or losses. You can combine a charitable contribution, dividend received deduction, and net operating losses. So there's a lot, believe it or not, that's a lot of benefit, okay, for the consolidated return. And the best way to illustrate this is to actually look at an example to show you the effect of a consolidated return. So let's take a look at Mays, owns 100% of ECRU Corporation, and both have a calendar year for tax purposes. For 2018, they had the following transaction and they file a separate return. So now they're filing separately. May's income from operation, 300,000, capital gain, 50. They have a capital loss. Uh, well, that's cap they don't have a capital loss. They have a charitable contribution of 40,000, of which they can only take 35. Why can they only take 35? Because there is a 10% limit on the taxable income. So basically, if we take 300,000 plus, three plus 50 is 350 times 10%, they can only take 35,000 of deduction. Therefore, what they did, Maze, they have a 5,000 carryover of a charitable contribution, okay? Uh, so their taxable income is 315. ECRU, they have income from operation for, um, for 170. They have no deduction is allowed. They have a 45,000 of capital loss not allowed, which is zero because you cannot, you can only deduct it up to the extent of income. And they have taxable income of 170, taxable income of 170. Now simply put, I just wanna look at this. If we can combine 315 plus 170 together, I just wanna show you their taxable income is 485,000 together. 
if they file separately. Let's take a look, see what happened if they file a joint return. If they file a joint return, they will combine their income, 300 plus 170, their Consolidated income is 470. They have capital gain, so M have a capital gain of 50. E have a capital loss of 45. Now we can use this capital loss, so now we were able to utilize this capital loss. So we have a net capital gain of 5,000. Now the charitable contribution, we can deduct all the 40,000. Why? Because 475, okay, now 475, which is those two, 475,000 times. 475 times 10% we can take up to 47,500 in charitable contribution because we are limited to 10%. Well guys, 40,000 is below so we were able to so we were able to do two things. We were able to take advantage of the capital loss, we were able to take advantage fully of the charitable contribution. So all in all, our taxable income is 435. Notice 435 versus 485, there's a difference and we saved money by consolidating. Okay? So notice the consolidated return allow one group to use the losses to offset the group of the, the other company's group, which is, that's really good. Now, bear in mind, this is really good. Congress is aware of this, okay? This possibility could lead to major tax avoidance because what happened is companies will buy up other companies that they have losses and they will take their income to offset their losses. So what happened, um, what happened, the Congress created some safeguards to stop, to, to limit those uh, to, to, to limit those potential abuses. So one safeguard against the use of losses and deduction arose that arose in a separate return year. So simply put, if you buy an asset that have losses from other years, you can you cannot use them for this year. Another safeguard is the use of losses and deduction when ownership changes, when the affiliated group has taken place. So when there's changes, some of the you might lose some of the losses because now you have new owners. Okay. And the best way to illustrate this is to look at an example. For the calendar year 2018 k corporation and s corporation first elected to file a consolidated joint return as of january 1st starling owned a land health as an investment with a basis of three hundred thousand. they have a basis of three hundred thousand and a fair market value of 280 so they have a loss technically they have a loss of twenty thousand on this asset it's unrealized nevertheless it's a loss that they have during 2018 the land is sold for 270 on a consolidated return, you, you can only take 10,000. Why? Because when you bought this, when they started to consolidate, the law, the the value was 280. When you sold it, the value is 270. So you cannot compare 270 to 300. That's the point. Okay. The other 20,000 lot that. The other 20,000 loss comes from a separate return and related to Starlink. It cannot be used by an affiliated group. Now, when we sell this asset to an outside party, then we can take the, the losses. We can consider this 300,000, okay? Also remember the deferral of certain intercompany sales can be advantageous. So if we have a deferral of gains, that's good. But remember, if we have losses and we have to defer the losses, that's not good because in taxes, we want to take the losses. We like losses, we like expenses. But if we're filing an affiliated return, we cannot, we cannot take advantage of those losses. So the realized gain or loss from the intercompany sale is not recognized but deferred. And let's assume in 2018, Peach Corporation sells a land basis of 100,000 to B for its fair market value of 180. So they have a gain. Both P, Peach and Beige are members of the same affiliated group and file a tax return. Although they have 80,000 realized gain, none of it is recognized. Why? Because it's an affiliated group. Okay, so the third gain or loss may be recognized in later year when the property is sold to an outsider. So let's assume we sell this property to an outsider in year 2020. Okay, let's assume we sold it to a developer for 210,000. Well, guess what now? We sold it for 210. We're going to subtract 100,000 as the basis, and now we have to pay taxes on the 100 and 10,000. So notice, although we did not pay taxes on the 80,000 in 2018, all what happened is, is this gain was the third. So when we sold it for 210, we would still have to use the $100,000 basis because we deferred the gain. And basically, we saved money for three years. We saved, let's assume, you know, the tax rate is 20%. So for 80,000 times 20%, we end up not paying 16,000 for three years until we sold it to a third party. So it's not bad at all. Now, all what I want to remind you is this. 
I'm always here to help you. If you have any questions, you, ha you can contact me. I strongly encourage you to visit my website and subscribe. You're going to study for your CPA exam once. You're studying for your college career once. Invest, and this is an investment in your career. Good luck, and if you have questions about this recording, please contact me. Good luck.